If someone asks you a question such as, what is the most difficult aspect of Christianity for you to keep, what would you say? What gives us the most trouble in our life in accomplishing as Christians? Would it be keeping the Sabbath, keeping it holy and observing it the way God instructs us? How about tithing? Oh boy, today's economy, that would be pretty tough for people to look at who didn't know about these things and say, that's kind of tough. Or maybe overcoming a bad habit, something that we really struggle with. Or controlling our attitude, controlling our minds, what goes in, what we're doing with those things. Would you say those are the difficult things? Or maybe fasting is another one that's, that's pretty hard to do, especially getting around hour 23 or so. But believe it or not, the most difficult thing that many people have a problem with in their Christian life, and it may be hard for some to believe, is prayer. Yes, it's prayer. To pray effectively and to have a regular, healthy prayer life is really hard for a lot of people. It's been noted through the years that whenever people counsel with a problem, difficulties in their life, and it can run the gamut from personal problems to family problems to work problems, I don't care what it is, financial problems, people also often admit that their prayer life is not what it should be. It's lacking. We can say how easy it is to pray when we're in a jam, when things are really difficult, we're going through a difficult trial in our life, and yeah, maybe we can find a good, a good way to pray then. Or even when we're really blessed with something incredible that happened in our life, we can even find time to thank God for it. But on a day-to-day -day basis, on a regular day-to-day -day activity in our life, we find ourselves often going into spurts or running out of things to talk about with God, to pray about. We find that our busy activity, we got up a little late today and we ran out the door. And we got in, we were so tired at night, well, we'll put it off till tomorrow or the next or the next. How many days do we find ourselves doing this kind of thing? Have we really come to understand with the Spirit of God in us the incredible deep meaning and importance of a prayer life with God in our lives? Do we give that a lot of thought or do we take that for granted? Today we're going to see that prayer is not just something that we are expected to do as Christians, but it's, it's rather for us, it's a lifeline to get us through this life and into the next world world tomorrow that we're looking forward to when we're resurrected. Is that the way we're looking at prayer in our life? We might ask, is prayer really that necessary? Can we do, can we do all the other things that we're doing and satisfy God and not have to pray as well? Well, certainly the other things may very well be important, but we may have gotten off the track in terms of importance, in terms of priority of what are we doing in our life. Whenever we let down in our prayer life, brethren, our life will go down the hill as well. We can be guaranteed that that'll be the problem. Our life will go down as well. Whether it's individually or collectively, we can see that there is fruit from prayer if we are utilizing it in the right way. And if we're not, our values will get twisted. Nothing seems to be right. Lots of problems. We get negative. We can get sarcastic. We don't see the good things. We don't see any bright side to anything. We make wrong decisions, wrong choices in our life. And when it gets down to the bottom line, we may be missing a vital key to having these things work properly in our life. And that key, again, is prayer. So what is prayer? Now you say, well, we were in the church 40 years. I know what prayer is. Okay, maybe we do and maybe we don't. But prayer basically is simply our communicating with God on a one-to-one -one basis. Communicating with God, talking to God, relating to God, having discussions. A vital key in any close relationship, brethren, is communication. Whether it's friends, whether it's in work, whether it's home at, with a family, it's communication, right communication. And we can see that clearly with, with our friends and, and hopefully our spouses. I remember when, when my wife and I first started dating, well, back right after the flood or something, I guess. But anyway, when we first started dating, we would get together, we'd have a great time, we'd go out and we'd go to a movie, we'd go for a little something to eat, and we'd, I'd drop her back off at home, and we were talking the whole time. It was great. 
And then I'd get home and I'd call her back. Or she'd call me. And we'd talk for another hour on the phone. We just couldn't stop being together and talking. That communicating brought us together. That communicating helped us to get to know each other in a deeper, better way. Hopefully anyone who's in a situation like that where they are involved with someone, recognize the importance of that communicating and expressing to each other their thoughts and their feelings. And that's how a deep relationship is formed. And this relationship becomes a reality when we are doing our part in that. Not just being the listener, but being the talker, being involved, talking about prayer. That we're not just going through the motions, but it's a real, heartfelt, believing, fervent prayer. Is that our attitude? Let's turn back to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. And in verse 20, notice here, this is talking about, we know, the, the lay of the scene era and the last era before Christ returns. Revelation 3, verse 20, it says here that, Behold, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Talking about supping together, that can mean reflecting on having an intimate relationship, intimate fellowship, intimate talking together, communicating with one another. He says, if any man, any individual, whether man or woman, of course, just responds to his being there and knocking and hear his voice, that we would respond and want to talk back. He laid out the condition prior to this of the church at the end time, and he said that they needed to be zealous and to repent. Repent of what? Well, the fact that the door is closed and he's outside knocking tells you something is wrong. The door is not being opened. The communication is not there. Part of the problem here with this era is their self-sufficient attitude. That self-sufficient attitude is one that says, we have need of nothing. Matter of fact, that's what Christ condemned them for. Saying, we have need of nothing. Prayer is our understanding of the need to communicate with God, to beseech Him for our needs, our desires, or whatever it is we're talking about with God. A lack of prayer, brethren, says we don't really need God because we have everything we need already. According to Christ's assessment, zealous prayer is lacking in the church of God before He returns. And guess what? And that's who we are today. The last group before he returns. And what's this condition? One of needing nothing. Don't need to talk to God because we've got everything. What do we need? We don't need anything. The reality is, brother, we need to have this communication or we are not going to be in that resurrection or we're going to be having to go through that tribulation to get our heads on straight with God. And those, there'll be trials at that point that will certainly turn people to God. Do we want to go that far? Do we want to get to that point? Or do we want to learn now how invaluable this prayer really is? Turn over to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, and beginning in verse 1. It says, God who at sundry times and different manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Verse 2. And he has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the, power of, by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. This is the God of the universe. This is the, the one who, who the Father sent to start everything going on this planet. He is the one who created all things by his Father's direction. And it says here that in these last days, he has spoken to us directly. And we see here the last era has the door closed, doesn't hear him. He says, if you hear my voice, open. We're not hearing the voice. And it says here, in the last times, he is speaking to us. 
We're seeing here that God wants a relationship with us, brethren. He wants to talk with us. He wants to give us the information that we need. And we have it right here in our Bibles. He speaks to us, but what about the other side of this communication? What's happening here? Are we appreciating the fact that he sent his son to die for us so that we can have a relationship? Are we taking that for granted as well? Without Christ, we would be totally ignorant as the world is without God's Spirit, who God the Father is. Does the world really know who God the Father is? Oh, they worship God. They say they know God, but they don't know the God that we know. They don't know the God of the Bible. They don't know the God that Jesus Christ directed us to. Notice Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. Matthew 11, verse 25, says, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you, hid, you have hid these things from the wise and the prudent. The wise of this world, the majority of this world, have been blinded to what we understand and we know. He says, And you have revealed them unto babes. Notice, he says, you, you've kept these things from the wise and the prudent of this world, but you've revealed them to babes. Verse 26, and even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knows the Son but the Father. And neither knows any man the Father except the Son, and whoever he or the Son will reveal him. Think about that. Without Jesus Christ telling us who the Father is and revealing to us, we would not know who the Father is. So who is the world praying to? If they don't know who the Father is, who are they really praying to? They're not. And God is not going to hear or answer their prayers because he doesn't have a relationship with them. He's had a relationship only with those that he has revealed himself to. That is us. How thankful are we to have that kind of a relationship? When we think about 7 billion people on this planet today, how many has the Son revealed the Father to? We don't even know that number. We used to think we had a number because there was a number that we were told year after year that how many people were a part of the church. We don't know that today. Because the church is not an organization that you can get numbers from. It's a spiritual organism that only God knows who are His. So we don't know who that, what that number is. But I would say safely, in my estimation, the number is getting smaller as time goes on. Because more and more people don't see the importance of this relationship and understanding the need to obey God in the first place. We have to ask ourselves, what have you or I done to qualify for the ability to know God and the Son? Is there anything that we've done in our lives? No, nothing. And to not only know God, but to have a close relationship with Him, where we can approach the God of the universe any time we wish. How incredible is that? Are we utilizing it? Are we taking advantage of it? Or, or, or are we using it only as a, something to go to when we have a real crisis? Or we need that uh, little uh, rabbit's foot or something that we can go to when we think we want to talk to God? Turn to Second Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. 2 Peter 1, verse 2. Peter says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of, our, of Jesus our Lord. Grace and knowledge be multiplied unto you. How? Through the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ. Because we know God, and Christ in a personal way, we can have grace and peace abundantly, multiplied. This is not just grace and peace. This is grace and, and peace that is multiplied, an abundance of this in our life. How? By having the knowledge that has been brought to us by Jesus Christ about the Father and Himself. Can we see this in our lives today? Or are we so caught up in the trappings of the worldly distractions that we're not paying enough attention to this blessing that we have of being able to communicate with God in prayer. We can come to Him now because we have this knowledge and we can have abundance of, of grace and peace in our life if we're utilizing it. Verse 3, he goes on and says, 
according as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto this life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him, again, through the knowledge that's there, that, can, that has called us to glory and virtue. That word is excellence of character. Through this knowledge that we've been given and what God has made available to us by His, His Spirit, we have all of this available to us now. Verse 4, whereby we are given, uh, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I mean, if we can absorb all that he's saying here, we'd have to really do a lot of meditating on this. Because God has provided everything we need in this human realm in order for us to have a relationship with him, in order for us to be able to grow, to be able to overcome, to be able to attain salvation. How? Through the knowledge of Him and the Son. Through the knowledge that has been provided to have the ability to have virtue and character. By that ability that gives us the understanding of the promises that we have of eternal life waiting for us. The world doesn't know this, brethren. The world doesn't know this. Yet what is our response back to God in all of this? Take it for granted. Again, we live in a world where people are growing up today having so much around them, they don't even appreciate what they have. Do you don't think we're, we're affected by that in our lives as well? Children today are growing up. They've got all the, all the gadgets that they want. They can text. They can talk to each other. Uh, they can go on a computer and look at each other from their home in a distant place and talk to each other through the, the wonders of the, uh, the, the uh, technology that we have today. What did they do for that? Nothing. Their parents gave it to them. How thankful are the people today? Not very thankful. Not very thankful. Yet here we see God has provided everything we need in our life. How appreciative are we of that? Those promises that we can be the bride of Christ. God has made all things possible for us to have this relationship with Him. We have a calling we have an understanding. We have his word that teaches us, that speaks to us. What else do we need? What else can we possibly need in our life before we can say, Father, we, we have what we need that you've provided for us to have a relationship with you. So what is lacking? We're not communicating. We're not coming back to God. He's done all these things for us. What are we doing? Our part in this, is, in this relationship is to get closer to him in prayer in talking, in communicating. Are we taking advantage of this opportunity or do we see how important this valuable tool is of prayer for us today? Do we see that? How does God view our prayers? What does God think about prayers? How does he view prayers? Uh, is, is it only the communicating? Is it only the talking back? Revelation chapter 5. Let's go there. Revelation chapter 5. In verse 8, when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the 20, uh, 20, uh, four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and, a golden, and golden vials full of odors. They had golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Here we see these, the, the, the beasts, the 24 elders before the Lamb, and they have all these vials, these containers, that have odors in them. And he says they are the prayers of the saints. This odor, this smell that is coming up. They're at the very throne of God. They represent the prayers of the saints from the time of Abel till Christ's return. Those vials. Turn to Revelation chapter 8. Notice another example here of this. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 3. It says, Another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense. Now a censer was a container that was used to hold the fire. We'll see that in a little bit. Um, the fire that was put in it. And then they would put the incense in. And the incense on, in the fire would burn. And the smoke would come up out of the, out of the censer. It was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Notice. We see here this incense coming out of this censer mixed with the prayers of the saints going up before the throne of God. 
Brethren, this is our prayers talking about here. Our prayers are going up before the throne of the God of the universe. Verse 4, And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it to the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes. And this incense then was an offering where the smoke of it ascended up to God as a sweet-smelling savor. It was presented as an offering along with the prayers of the saints. And as they cast it down to the ground, it was a preview of what was coming with the next trumpets that were going to be coming after these, uh, after this, these uh, vials where the prayers were being brought before God. It was going to begin the trumpet plagues. And all this catastrophe that was going to be going on when the thunder and the lightnings began. So here we see again the smoke that went up and this smell that was before God is a, was an enjoyable smell that God had. And I could think about how I feel or I think about whenever I smell something good that's either cooking or if there is a, you know, a, a, a fireplace and uh, we had some years ago in our home, we had a fireplace and I had gotten some cherry wood from a cherry tree that was chopped down and I broke it in pieces and then we would throw it in the fire and the smell of that wood was incredible. It was so enjoyable, relaxing, comforting. The aroma of it was great. And I thought when God talks about the smell of the prayers coming up before him, this incense was a sweet smelling smell or savor. I think about how I enjoyed those smells of something cooking on the grill. You could smell that, the, the meat or whatever it was that's enjoyable to smell. It's enjoyable to smell that. And I could see how God viewed that in a way that he said he liked for that to come up. Turn to Psalm 141. Let's notice something that David said here in his prayer. Psalm 141 and beginning in verse 1. A Psalm of David. Lord, I cry unto you. That word cry means uh, in many places refers to our calling out to someone. To, to reaching out, to calling out. Or a prayer. He says, I cry or I pray unto you. Make haste unto me. Give ear unto my voice when I cry or reach out to you. Let my prayer be set forth before you as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. David here himself is relating that his prayer was like the incense going up before God and the evening sacrifice. So he was praying before he went to bed that night and that he was telling God to let his prayer be like that incense coming up that God would enjoy what he was bringing him and that he would get the help that he was looking for. Let's turn back to Exodus chapter 30. Let's go back and look a little bit more about this incense and what it was, how, it was, how it began and how it was used. Exodus chapter 30, we see here God gave instruction for burning the incense. Exodus 30, Genesis doesn't have Exodus in it. Exodus chapter 30. Exodus 30, right in the beginning, it tells us about this altar that was going to be made. Exodus 30, verse 1. You shall make an altar to burn incense upon of shittim wood, and shall, you shall make it. A cubit shall be the length, a cubit the breadth, four squares shall it be, and two cubits of the height of it. And the horns thereof shall be of the same. And then you'll overlay it with gold. He went all through this directing them on how they were to make this censer, uh, the, this altar rather, to burn the, scent, the incense. And they were to bring it and put it before, verse 6, you shall put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I meet with you. Now again, this is right outside the veil, right before the curtain, before the ark of the covenant. The closest thing to the ark of the covenant was what? The incense, this little altar that they used to burn the incense. Right outside the veil before the Holy of Holies. 
And we just read about how the smoke of this scent goes up before God right to his throne. So here in, in this type, when it was instituted, when it was given to Israel, they were doing the same thing, but they didn't recognize the value or the importance of it. To them, it was just doing what they were told to do. Going on in verse 7, And Aaron shall burn therein sweet incense every morning. Notice, sweet incense. Where he dresses the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at evening, so now he began it in the morning, and now also in the evening he's going to light it again, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall offer no strange incense uh, incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall you pour drink offering thereon. Nothing except what I tell you to put on there. This incense only. No strange incense, meaning something that you want to put on, something that you decide you think should be on that uh, altar. What God says should be. So again, our prayers are like the sweet-smelling incense that went up to God, morning and evening sacrifice. Our prayers, brethren, are a sacrifice that we bring up before God, that we lift up to God on a daily basis, bringing Him this incense, our prayers. And He told them they were to do this every day, morning and nighttime. Dropping down to verse 34. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take fragrant spices, Stakte, Onaika, and Galaban, or uh, Goblon, and pure frankincense in all equal amounts. You're going to take four different things to make this incense that you're going to put on here. Verse 35, and make a fragrant blend of the incense, the work of a perfumer. It is to be salted and pure and sacred. Sacred. Verse 36, grind some of it into powder and place it in front of the testimony in the tent of meeting where I will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. Again, representing prayers. God is saying to him, our prayers are very special. They're holy to God that we bring these, these prayers before him. Clearly, God did not take these offerings and sacrifices lightly. He gave clear instructions on how to make the altar, how to make the incense, how to put it together, how they were to put it, and how they were to light it and use it. Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 12. It says, He shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire off of the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony, that he die not. Follow the directions, do it the right way God says, and you won't die. You'll be blessed. You will live. They were to take this incense of burning coals from the altar, beat it small, grind it. Is that what we do with our prayers? Do we beat our prayers finely in this way? Do we grind it down to the point where we know that God's hearing right from the depths of our, from our heart of what we're asking? Or is it superficial? He says, no, they're to, they're to beat it small, grind it, and bring it to the veil. And when they were making the incense, it was to be beaten and ground. A certain way it should be done. Notice Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus 10 and verse 1. It says, And Nahab, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein. So here, Aaron's two sons, they each had a censer and they put fire in it and they, brought, and they put incense in it as well. And they offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And we read earlier how he told them it was supposed to be done. It says here, they offered strange fire, meaning it was fire that was not the way God told them to do it. It was different. They did it their way. And people pray to God their way. They don't do what God says to do. What about us? Are we following God's direction when we pray, or do we do it our way? Verse 2, it says, and there went uh, out fire from God and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. God made it clear, brethren, how this offering was to be handled. Yet they did not follow the instructions. They did it their way. 
Verse 3, it says, Moses said to Aaron after this, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, now again, this is repeating now what, what God says, I will be sanctified in them that come near to me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Now reading that from the NIV, you might get a little better sense of it. Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke of when he said, Among those who approach me, I will show myself holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. And Aaron remained silent. Why did he remain silent? Because he knew there would be no excuse for disobeying God's instructions. When they brought this fire, when they brought this offering, when they brought this incense, God is telling Moses here that when they approach me, I will show myself holy. How important is it, is it that we come before the holy God of the universe? We can't take that lightly. And in the sight of all the people, he says, I will be honored, glorified. By how? By the way we act in our lives. How do we represent our offerings before God in our lives? So we see how our prayers are likened to the incense that comes before God's throne. How seriously are we taking what we're doing today in our prayers? That this opportunity that we have to bring our offering of prayers, our petitions, our requests, and lay them before the feet of the eternal God. Right before His throne. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. The Levites were instructed, instructed how to come with the incense. He specified what the incense was to be made of along with how it should be done. Notice in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7 what Jesus tells us we should avoid in our prayers. What do we need to be careful with? Matthew 6 and verse 7, Jesus says, But when you pray, do not use vain repetition as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Nonsense. Just on and on, babbling, saying nothing. Vain repetition. You know, I remember growing up, there were these little things that we would carry around in our pocket and we would have little beads around them and you just one after the other after after the other you had about 50 or 60 little prayers that were nothing but the same one over and over that was supposed to be praying that's what we learned as children growing up what prayer was and Christ says here that's vain repetition useless worthless verse 8 don't be like them for your father knows what things you need of before you ask him and some people respond and say, well, since God knows all things, then do I really need to ask Him? The reality is that as a loving Father, He wants to hear from us. He wants, to bring, he wants us to bring Him all of our concerns, our fears, whatever we need to have to ask His help in our lives directly. He wants to hear from us. And there are times, brethren, that we feel that God hasn't heard our prayers or they're not being answered. Let's turn to James chapter 4 and see why that might be the case. James chapter 4, beginning in verse 2. Again, we saw in Israel, for the Levites, how they were to approach God with this incense. James chapter 4 tells us something interesting here. In the NIV, it says, you want something, but you don't get it. Oh, you want something, you need something, you recognize you have a, a, a need of something in your life, but you're not getting it. He goes on and says, you kill and you covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel, you fight, you don't have because you do not ask God. You don't ask God. Very simple, basic point here he's making. You don't have things because you don't ask. Verse 3, and when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend, it, uh, may spend what you get on your own pleasures. So when we come before God in prayer, is it to ask for things for ourselves? Are our prayers selfish in content? Are our prayers acts of a daily ritual of some kind? Do we plan out our prayers? You know, think about it. Do we plan out our prayers before we go to God? Do we really ask God what we're looking to know? Do we think it through? This is really important that we bring these prayers to God. Is God our last choice before seeking help? We are coming before the one true God. How much do we meditate on what we're going to bring God in our prayers? 
you know, meditation is one of the tools that we have. Do we meditate and think about what we're going to bring God and how we're going to approach Him and ask Him for these things? You know, we're not saying that prayer has to be a formal event, that we've got to come before God with a suit and tie and have a, a formal written out prayer before us. But do we think it through what we want to know from God? What are we asking for? Our prayers should reflect our earnest, our passionate, our wholehearted pouring out of those things that we're struggling with in our life. Passionately asking God. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Hebrews 4 and verse 14. It says, Seeing he, then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we don't have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but as in all points was tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. We read earlier that with the knowledge of God and Christ, we can have this close relationship using prayer to obtain mercy and grace and help in everything we, we ask for. And here we have someone that is our high priest that can go before us as an as a, uh, advocate to bring our prayers before God. Are we recognizing that value? Do we pray fervently? Think about when we are praying that we are entering the sanctuary of the God of the universe that we are going before the great God, that we don't take this lightly in how we act or how we think. So let's look at some things that we can do then to enhance what we're doing in this prayer. Make this a, a real important thing in our life. Because we want a close relationship with God. A close relationship is one that will always be looking to God for guidance and help. And we do that when we do His will. That's the first and foremost thing. That we do things according to His will. When we pray according to His will. Turn to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 34. The night Jesus was taken and tortured after the Passover with His disciples, He went out to Gethsemane to pray. And notice how this prayer went. Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 14, again, verse 34. <laughs> He said to them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Wait here and watch. And he went forward a little, and he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him, or the event would go away or not happen. He wouldn't have to go through this. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto you. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, he says, not what I will, but what you will. Christ says, no, it's not what I will. He asked him to do this, but he says, not what I will. And he did this three times. He brought this prayer before the Father, always asking in accord with the Father's will. He set us an example of how we go to God in our prayer. We ask for something, but realize it must be according to his will. The word Abba that he used there. It's a loving reference to a father by the children. A loving reference. Now he said, Abba, Father. Father means the parental unit, the one who's the, who created the, the individual, the, the one in charge, the father, uh, biological father in that sense. Yet he said, Abba, Father. And that word has a loving reference by, by children to it. We would say something like dad or daddy or and my little grandson, whenever he comes over the house, he comes over and he says, Papito. <laughs> He's not Spanish or anything. I don't know how he got it. But it's his loving way of saying grandpa to me, grandfather, or papa, or poppy, or whatever. A loving, kinder relationship than the formal sounding father. And Christ went before him that night and said, Abba, Daddy, Father, hear my prayer according to your will. Now, growing up in the world that we live in today, we may not have had an Abba-Father relationship in our life. Yet, brethren, we have been adopted. We have been adopted sons of the most loving and caring Father that ever was. Jesus Christ's Father. 
Is he real to us? Do we have that kind of relationship that we look at him as a father, maybe in a father that we never had? Or if we did have a father that was like that, we can go to him and relate that we could bring this to him? Romans chapter 8. Beginning in verse 15, Paul uses the same term here in our relationship with God. Because after baptism, we are the adopted sons of God. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 15. Paul says, Therefore you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Daddy, Father. And the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We can come to God as a father. He is our father. We can come like we, a child comes to ask their dad for something. And they don't hold back. They're not fearful. They're not, they're not apprehensive. They're totally open and want to ask dad for whatever it is they would like. Jesus prayed that prayer three times, asking the father's will. How many times do we implore God when we, go, when we are going through a difficult trial, do we quit after the first? If we go to him first, do we quit? Do we quit after the second? How many times do we go to him? Turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. Luke 18 and verse 1. And he spoke a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Notice, Christ is saying here, he gave them a parable telling them, relating to the fact that they need to always pray, not sometimes, not when it's convenient, not when we remember. We are to always pray and not faint, not quit, not give in, not back down on our prayers. Verse 2, saying that there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said to, within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard, regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary, weary me. She'll wear me out from asking over and over and over. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge says. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, which call out to God for help day and night, though he bear long with them, though he may even allow it to go on for a time? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? And we'll see that that's another characteristic we need to em employ here. Sometimes, brethren, God will make us wait a long time for an answer to see if we have the faith in God to keep on praying, to keep on asking, to keep coming to Him, because there may be a reason why He's holding back on this, and we're not sure what it is. Notice in Luke chapter 11. Luke 11, beginning in verse 1, It came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples came unto him and said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Now, you think that these Jews did not know how to pray or had no idea what to pray? I'm sure they knew about prayer. I'm sure they understood what it was. And yet it says here, as Jesus was praying himself, they saw him his prayer and they wanted to know, how are you doing it? Because we see your example, your life, your way. We want to emulate that. How about us? Do we want to emulate what Christ did in his life? That we are asking as well as they did at that time. Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. They were looking for motivation. They were looking for some way to do this that, that, would, that would make it more exciting for them. Verse 2 through 4, he gave them an outline. And if we go back in Matthew chapter 6, we'll see the same thing that he outlined there. And we're not going to cover any of that today. But as a point of information, Mr. Smith gave a multi-part series on this outline prayer that he gave. So we won't go through that. But dropping down to verse 5. And he said to them, which of you, having a friend, 
shall go to him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I don't have anything set to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give you. And I say unto you, that though he will not rise and give him, because he is a friend, yet because of his importuning, he will rise and give him as much as he needs. Notice the importuning, the going back and asking again and again. And I ask you, and, and I say unto you rather, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks shall receive. He that seeks shall find. And to him that knocks it shall be opened. Verse 11, if a son asks for bread from any of you, that is a father, will he give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If then you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? That's the key, to ask God. If our prayers aren't being answered, are we taking to heart what we read earlier in James? That you don't ask, so you don't receive? And Christ is saying here, if you want these things, we need to ask. How much more, he says, will God give us the Spirit if we ask Him? Telling us that we need to be asking God for things. He's not just going to give it to us arbitrarily if we're not interested in having it and wanting it. We don't see the value in having it or needing it. The disciples were human like we are. They had the same difficulties that we do. And certain, and, and one of those things, obviously, was prayer. They didn't understand the way Christ needed to explain to them. So not only did he give them that outline, but he gave them the importance of the prayer to ask, to seek, and to knock. In the account of Matthew, he gives more on the how-to Matthew 5, I'm sorry, Matthew 6 and in verse 5. Let's go there. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. Matthew 6 and verse 5. No, I'm not dyslexic. Matthew 6, verse 5. When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. For truly, I say unto you, they have their reward. And for some people, praying is an act of vanity and pride wanting to show how eloquent their speech is before others. Verse 6, but when you pray, don't do the way they other, the others do. When you pray, enter into your closet. That word really means a secret or private room. Go to a private place. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father which is in secret. And your Father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. Verse 7, but when you pray, again, don't use vain repetition like the heathens do. for they shall be heard of their much speaking. So we need to take that direction that Christ gave us and do that. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. Again, recognizing the importance of doing His will. 1 John, uh, 1 John chapter 5 verse 14. It says, And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. This is the confidence we have to know that if we ask anything, how? According to his will. That we don't ask things outside of God's will that are not within the realm of what God would want for us. Now, of course, that means we need to do studying into what is God's will. What is it that God wants? What did Christ say he did? He came to do the will of the Father. Everything he did was to reveal the Father and do the will of the Father. That means keeping the commandments, living by them, not compromising, following them as God shows us we are to live by them. The next thing we want to ask is, do we, have, do we believe in the power of this prayer? Do we have real faith in God? Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 19. Matthew 21, and in verse 19. 
Seeing a fig tree by the road, he came over to it and found nothing on it but leaves, and he said, he said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither so soon? And Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith, and no doubt you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but I say, but also I say unto you, to, to this mountain, be removed and cast it into the sea, it will be done. Verse 22. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Now we don't expect to go throw mountains in the, into the sea. That's not what he's talking about here. He's saying, but you need to have belief in order to expect your prayers to be answered. You've got to believe what we're asking he can and will do. Whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, having the faith, the confidence to know that God can do what he said, what he makes available. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith is it, impo it is impossible to please God, for he that comes to God must, be a, must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Do we believe that? As we are diligently seeking him in prayer, do we believe that he can do these things? Going back one chapter in Hebrews 10 and verse 38, it says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draws back or fails to do this, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to, unto perdition, but of them that believe unto the saving of the soul. We have all confidence and faith that God can do whatever he said he will do. Whatever he's made available to us. Our God is a loving father who desires to give good things to his children. What is it that we can't bring before God? What is it that we don't believe God can do in our lives? What thing can we possibly bring to him that we can say, no, God can't take care of this. Not even God can do this. There is nothing, brethren, that God cannot do if we believe that he can answer our prayer. Two years ago, my wife and I wanted to go down after finding out in the last minute that our son was going to be baptized in Florida. So we wanted to go down, but we couldn't. It was right before the Passover. We couldn't make the trip, drive down and come back, but it was only a few days before, and we couldn't afford to go. I mean, the price of an airline ticket was outrageous in, in, within a week, within a day or two, actually. So my wife said, well, let's pray about it, and we'll ask God to... to to do this. So we did. We prayed and we asked God. And that night I went and I called. And lo and behold, everything was the same. The price of the tickets were the same. Um, the availability was the same. It was a no-go. We couldn't go. Couldn't happen. The next morning, we were sitting around talking. And my wife said, looked at me and she says, what is it that God can't do? How hard is it for God to get two airline tickets when he owns the universe. Is it possible he can't do that? So we prayed again. Went up to the, to the office, got online. I actually went on to, a, made the phone call, and we got two tickets to go to Florida the next day for less money than we ever imagined to go. It was, it was just incredible that it was available for us to do this. What's impossible for God to do? Give you an airline ticket for the next day? Would, he, would we even think of going to ask God again for it? Turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse 6. James tells us here, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, or don't doubt. For he that wavers, or he that doubts, is like the wave of a sea, driven with the wind and tossed back and forth, up and down. Verse 7, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. If you doubt, you're not going to receive. Because we're already convinced in our mind God can't do it. Well, he's not going to do it for us then. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Doubting God, brethren, will destroy our faith in him. We can't allow that to happen. If for us to have successful prayers, to, for us to have our prayers answered, We've got to believe that he can answer these prayers, no matter what they are. No matter what trial we've been dealing with for how many years, whatever problem we've been experiencing in our life, he can take care of it. Ask again. 
and again. Turn to Psalm 78, verse 17. Notice God's view of this attitude. Psalm 78, verse 18, And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Verse 19, And, he, and they spoke against God, and they said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Oh, come on, now let's not be ridiculous. We're, in the, we're out in the desert here. There's no way God's going to provide a table in the wilderness. Verse 20, Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Well, it's not enough that we have water. Now we, need, we, we want bread. Can he do bread? Can he be, provide fresh uh, flesh for his people to eat, food? Dropping down to verse 41. It says, yes, they turned back and tempted God, and they limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. Our doubting God, brethren, our lack of faith, our disbelief in what God can do will limit God and in his, in, his involvement in our life. Their lack of belief, their turning back, resulted in God limiting them. That's what he says. We can't focus on the problem and think that God can't take care of something. We can't do that. If we've got a problem, bring it before God. Beat it fine. Lay it out for Him so He knows what we're asking. Let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. Let's notice one who had faith and trust in God for his prayers. Nehemiah chapter 1 beginning in verse 2. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 2, it says, And Hanani, one of the brethren, came, and he, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Verse 4. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned certain days, and fasted, and prayed before the God of heaven. What did he do? What was his initial reaction when he heard this? Yes, he wept. There's a time to cry. There's a time to go through the, the pain of something. And as soon as that was done, it said he, uh, he fasted, and he prayed to the God of heaven. His immediate response was to bring his concern to God. What do we do first? Do we bring our concerns before God in prayer? Or do we start, do we forget the importance of this prayer? Do we forget where that incense is going to? Do we take what's going on and try to figure out how to get out of this now? Going on in verse 5, it says, And it said, I beseech you, O Lord of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keeps covenant of mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Verse 6, let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which have sinned against you. Both I and my father's house have sinned. Verse 7, we have dealt very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments you have commanded your servant Moses. Notice what he does here. He starts out his prayer beginning with praise for God and his mercy. He proceeds to ask God to hear his plea for help. Then he goes on and acknowledges Israel's sins and not following after God, offering his repentance for the people. That's a thought-out prayer. That's not just saying, God, you got to do something. No, he thought about what went into this. There was sin that was involved. There was a need for repentance. There was the acknowledging of who I am bringing this to and that you can do all things. He had that faith and confidence. Verse 8, Remember, I beseech you, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. Verse 9, But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though you, there were all of you cast to the outermost parts of heaven, yet I will gather them from there and bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. He's saying here, even bringing out God's word here in his prayer, reminding of God what Moses had said, that if we transgress, there is a way to come back. There is a way to get back in harmony with you again. 
This was all part of his prayer. He was acquainted with God's word and was able to quote where applicable. Can we do that? Do we do that? Do we use God's word in our prayers to, uh, to make more clear what we're looking for? Verse 10. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by great power and by strong hand. O Lord, I beseech you, let now your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name, uh, who desire to fear your name and prosper. I pray you, the, uh, your servant, this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. In other words, I'm going to be going to someone and I'm bringing you this prayer that you would intervene here because I was the king's cupbearer. I have a relationship with him. I can go there now if you can help here, if you will intervene. Again, he was asking for God to be attentive to the prayer of his servant, meaning himself. How close of a relationship does this prayer reveal? Is this the way we come before God, asking a prayer this way? His first reaction was to bring it to God in prayer. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 2. After he went before the king, the king said to him, Why is your countenance so sad, seeing that you're not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. And then I was sore afraid. So he had a relationship with this individual that knew him enough to say, wait a minute, you know, I, I could tell the way you look, you're not happy. Things aren't, something is wrong. You're, and I know you're not sick. You don't look sick. What's going on? Something in your heart is bothering you and you're, and you're inside of you. You're upset. Verse 3, and I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should my, not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulcher, lies waste and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said to me, for what do you make your request? Well, what are you asking? Now, he jumped back and said, well, here's what we need to do. You've got you to do, no. What does it say here, the next thing? So I prayed to the God of heaven. He's being asked here, what would you like me to do? And what did he say? Immediately, he stopped and prayed. What are we told uh, in, by Paul? To be instant in prayer. Immediately, he prayed. The quickest reaction to turn to God for help. We could say, well, we've already prayed about this. Well, he understood how important it was that he had prayed earlier, and now he comes before the individual, appears that his prayer has been answered, yet when he's about to make the request, he goes to God again and prays. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Philippians 4, verse 6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and by supplication, with thanksgiving, let your, your request be made known unto God. In other words, don't worry, don't fear. Be confident when you ask that you know your answer is going to be from God with thanksgiving. Jesus also had that understanding, that attitude. Of course, he inspired Paul to write it, so... Let's go back and see how Christ did this. John chapter 11, verse 39. John chapter 11, verse 39. Here Jesus comes to the, uh, the uh, sepulcher of Lazarus. It says, Take away the stone, Martha, the sister of him that was dead. Saith unto him, Lord, by this time, and she said unto him, Lord, by this time he must be smelling, he must stink, for he has been dead for four days. And you want us to remove the stone here. And Jesus said to her, Said I not unto you that, I, that if you would believe, you should see the glory of God? Do you doubt or do you believe? I told you to believe and you will have your prayer, your request answered. They took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I knew, verse 42, that you hear me always. But because of the people which are standing here, I said that, that they may believe that you have sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Even before he told Lazarus to come forth, Christ said in front of the people, I thank you, God, that you have heard me. He knew that the Father heard him. He says, and I knew that you always hear me. Is that how we view our prayers as well? Do we have that confidence to know that when we go before God, we can thank Him before it even happens because we know He always hears us? 
Have we beaten our prayers that finely to have that confidence? The third element that we want to talk about is that we, that we need to realize that if we want to have our prayers answered, along with the fact that we are asking for His will, and that we have the faith and the belief that He can do it, that we have to be, avoid the thing that will destroy that prayer time, and that is sin. Because sin will separate us from God. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59, beginning in verse 1. Isaiah 59, verse 1, it says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities, your sins, have separated you from your God. Notice, your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Our sins are not just a problem for us, but they're, they're eliminating our opportunity to go to God in prayer. He will not hear you. The problem with human nature is we can't see ourselves as God does. It's not in us to live by God's ways. Notice in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23. Jeremiah 10 verse 23. It says, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walks to direct his steps. So we don't have the ability to do this on our own. We can't figure out how to make our life work. That's why we need the prayer. That's why we need the communication with God. So we can go to Him and ask for what it is we need to do to make changes in our life or to have our request filled. Notice 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 verse 8. John tells us here we're to be careful that we're not deceiving ourselves. 1 John 1 verse 8 says if we, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Oh, yes, there is sin in our life. You know, there are some people think, well, I keep the Sabbath, the holy days, and I tithe, and I go to the feast, and I, you know, I don't eat pork and shellfish, and, you know, I don't sin. But that guy over there, I want to just give him one, sh no, that's not right. That's not, that's sinning, a wrong attitude, anger, resentment, bitterness. How many things are we sinning that we don't even realize we're sinning with? Verse 9, he says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Let's not kid ourselves. There is sin in our life that we may not even realize we're doing. Ask God for the help. Psalm 139, verse 23. Psalm 139, verse 23. David sought God's help to see himself. Verse 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. David's saying, Look, I, I can't do this myself. You search me. You help me to know my heart. You try me. You know my thoughts. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me to the way everlasting. Show me and then direct me the right way to go. So as we approach Passover this year, we are encouraged more than ever to be mindful of how the sin that we have that is so pervasive in our lives that we've got to get rid of it. You know, how much sin is too much? <laughs> you know, God tells us a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It fills the entire lump of dough. How much sin can we allow or tolerate or think God is accepting that in our life? The answer is zero. Nada. Nothing. Psalm 19, verse 12. Psalm 19, verse 12. Paul, uh, David says here, who can understand his errors? Cleanse you me from my secret faults, the things I can't see, or the things I may be holding on to that I won't reveal to anyone that are mine. Keep back your servant from all, also from presumptuous sins or willful sins. Don't let them have dominion or rule over me. And then I shall be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. In other words, let my prayer, my offering of incense come up before you and be acceptable so that I don't get caught up in all this because I can't get out of it myself. Psalm 40, verse 12. Psalm 40, verse 12, it says, For innumerable evils have encompassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I'm not even able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. 
Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. He's pleading, he's imploring with God to help him. To cleanse him from these things that he's dealing with in his life. He says, it, it, it's so much that I can't even look up. That word there where it says that to look up can be the result of either exhaustion from suffering the consequences of the sin where he's just so weak he can't even lift his head. And that sin and guilt can prevent us from looking or coming before God. Just the way Adam and Eve, because of the, the, the guilt that they had, and they hid themselves when God came before them. And why? Because they knew that they did something wrong. And they couldn't look up to God. They hid themselves from God. So Luke 18, verse 13, let's not turn there, but we have another example of the publican who could not lift his eyes to God because he admitted that he was a sinner. When we're sinning, we can't look up to God. We can't lift our prayers up to God because we know we're not right with Him. So we've got to do what David did. Psalm 51, verse 3. Psalm 51, verse 3. David says here, For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done evil in your sight that you may be justified when you speak and be clear when you judge. Verse 5, he says, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the part, hidden part you shall make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Verse 10, he says, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. This was David's prayer of repentance. Asking God to create a clean heart in him that he could start over again. See, we don't have to avoid going to God if we've sinned. We have to just recognize we need to repent first. Acknowledge that sin that will separate us from God and then we can go to him and ask for whatever we need or want. Psalm 66 and verse 18 Psalm 66, verse 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. But truly, God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Why? Because he knew enough to repent and seek God and get back with him. If sin is preventing our approaching God, we need to immediately stop the sinning and repent. It's not that hard. God has given us the way to do it and the spirit and the power to accomplish it. Not on our own, it can't be done. Because brethren, separation from God will bring eternal death. We don't want that. We've, we've had too much to look forward to. We need to determine to be examining ourselves regularly and not compromise with God or not justify or not lower our standards of how we look towards God's word to accept the standards of man in place of God's standards. James chapter 5. James chapter 5 and verse 13. James says here, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Notice verse 6. Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. If we are sinning and we're going to God, we've got to ask to be forgiven. Confess our sins before God and then we can be forgiven. If you're sick and we ask for anointing, what, was there something that we did to bring this on that we need to repent for? Maybe our lifestyle that brought us to a place where we're sick? Something we eat? How we live? Staying up 20, 20 hours a day because we're too busy uh, on Facebook or something? I don't know. But what is it that we're doing that we could create a problem in our life that we're making ourselves sick? He says, repent of the sins and God will heal us. We need to pray with a sense of urgency. Because it's so important what we're bringing to God. John chapter 15. 
Every manner of evil, brethren, comes from abandoning our prayer life. Everything that we do in our life that is evil is a, is a, is a result of our not being close to God in prayer, in our relationship. Quality of prayer is more important than the amount of time. You know, some people say, well, you've got to pray so much time a day. No, it's not a matter of time. It's a matter of the, 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 the quality of it. The importance of what we're doing. John chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken you. you know, we, we are clean. He has made us clean. We're baptized. We've been gone through the, 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 the baptismal pool. We've been washed clean. Our sins have been forgiven. He says, verse 4, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abides in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. We cannot be separate from God. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Brethren, if we're not showing fruit in our life, we're not close to God. We're not abiding with him. He's not working through us because we're separate from him. Verse 6, if any man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them, cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, notice, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Do we want our prayers answered? We need to be abiding in Christ. We need to have a relationship with him that is close. That word abide means to continue with, to dwell, to be present to be given in a state, uh, uh, in, in a given of a, to be in a given state, or a relationship of expectancy that we are expecting something from God. John chapter sixteen, this very last area you want to touch on here, John chapter sixteen verse twenty-two. It says, "And now, therefore, uh, and, and you now therefore have sorrow." But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy shall no man take from you. This is before he, would be, he was going to be killed. He says, In that day you shall ask me nothing. Truly, I say unto you, whatever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. <clears throat> Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive it, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken to you in Proverbs. But the time comes when I shall no more speak to you in Proverbs, but I, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. And that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and, then, and have believed that I came from God. So he's saying here, whatever we ask, we will have if we ask it in his name. We have been given the privilege to come before God to bring our prayers, our offerings, these incense that we bring to him in the name of or by the authority of Jesus Christ. How blessed are we to have that? Brethren, as we continue in our walk with God, one that is based on a close relationship, let's be sure that we are keeping the lines of communication open with God. That we can feel confident that He will hear our prayers if we are offering up incense that is pleasing to Him. One, that is seeking His will. Two, that we have faith in His promises. Three, that we are obedient to Him and we are sure to repent of those things we're doing wrong. Let's close in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Peter 4 and verse 7, it says, But the end of all things is at hand. Be you therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Let's be watching as we draw near the end. Let's really strive, brethren, to be more diligent in our prayers. Let's be praying like our life depends on it. Because it does.